Okay, so for today's episode on the podcast, we have my friend Quilty Covers, aka Reese. His real name is Reese, and his uh, his handle on Instagram is Quilty Covers. And today we're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about barefoot minimalist running. And um, lately, you've been uh, running every day, Reese, and there's not many people out there, without blowing my own trumpet here, there's not many people out there that run as consistently as I do. And I've noticed on Strava that you're one of the very few people that I've got on Strava, apart from like really elite athletes, that is running every single day. And yeah, that's that's a good place to start, I think, is what, what benefits have you noticed from this and what would you say are any bad points or any setbacks or problems you've encountered during this? So to start, to start the ball off with, with the, the running every single day, um, for me, that was a challenge that I set myself. And I, I'll admit it was somewhat inspired by the, uh, by Hela Sidibe, um, who it was, is quite a well-known uh, YouTuber and Instagrammer now who started the challenge of running every day. And he's been doing it somewhat in the region of 1600 days. And I listened to his podcast with Rich Roll and I was quite a regular runner. I was running four, five, sometimes six times a week, but I wasn't quite doing that every single day. So I set myself the challenge of it. And for me, it was a mixture of just getting it done because I always made far too many excuses to actually run every single to, to run. Um, I was very easy to go, oh, I'm not going to do it today because it's late. or I'm not going to do it today because I feel a little bit tired. So I, for me, it was a way of that accountability. And so I just started naturally going every single day. So I've set myself the criteria of at least two miles. That was my, my I had to do it least that for it to count for me and I had to do it start it within the 25 um hour window so if you admittedly if you look on my Strava when I've been lazy I've fallen asleep in the evenings and woke up before midnight I have chucked myself out for a two mile run to make sure I get that day ticked off what what have I noticed since I've noticed that my fitness um has improved um, I've noticed that my resilience has improved and I've noticed that my discipline has also improved on that front. So I found that when, when I'm trying to come up with those excuses to not do it, I'm more likely to go, yes, well, you're going to run your streak. And I'm now just shy of about 200 days, which is quite a lot. I don't want to start back at zero. So when it comes to late in the evenings and I'm deciding to uh, potentially give it up for the day, that will be what gives me that last bit of motivation to kick me out the door and get me on the road and to do at least two miles, which for me is around 16, 17 minutes on a slow day. And that's that it's done. It's ticked off. And that's, that's where my mindset sits with it. Challenges that I've faced during. So for, as you can imagine that consistency um, and the fact that we're such um, sedentary animals nowadays for me, it was the little niggles, the, the tight hip flexors, the, the tight calves, the tight feet, the, the hamstring is feeling a little bit iffy for that day. So for me, those were the main challenges that I faced with it. And, and with that, I found that I wanted to make sure that I was resilient um, and an injury, on an injury point of view. So I made sure that I increased my yoga, increased the massage, um, going in foam rolling, stretching, trying to do that as religiously as possible. And then the other thing is sleep, is simply sleeping um, as much as I can to make sure that I'm in a good place, resilience wise, so that I'm not getting those injuries from constantly running. Yeah, man, I've seen you talk about, about sleep on your Instagram and stuff before, so we'll, we'll definitely get onto that at some point uh, i'm sure that will be useful information for all the listeners and yeah i like i like the way that you you kind of combined running more with doing more of the other stuff to help you run more so it's kind of like mm -hmm. and that's that's this is kind of one of the, the battles that comes with doing these sort of things these sort of I suppose you could call it a challenge is that you have to 
accept the fact that not only are you going to be spending more time doing the running, you need to be spending more of your time doing these other things to allow you to even be able to do that running. So how did you, like, how did you find ways to create more time to do all this stuff? Cause it, it, it does take time or, or did you, did you perhaps find ways to like do your foam roll in at certain points of the day where you're doing other things or how, how did you, have you got any sort of tactics so, used? So for me, um, one, one of the key things that I've, um, that I've always tried to do is schedule my days. So I always have a diary. I try and make sure that I schedule it from the night before what time I want to run, what time I need to stretch. Um, so that I, in my head, I already have that blueprint for the day. So that was my first way of finding time in the day. The second, the second way for me was we all do it. We all put on Netflix, YouTube, TV series, whatever it may be in the evenings. And we all make sure that we allocate time for that because that's our escapism. So what I what I decided to do was, yes, I'll admit I still like that escapism, though mine's probably a bit more niche than other people's. I made sure that when I was stretching, foam rolling, whatnot, that's at the same time I was watching the things that I wanted to watch. So that escapism was, I was multitasking in a sense, so that. Yes, I was getting that little bit of a, of a, oh, I feel good. I've watched something that I like in the evening. But at the same time, I knew that well, I've done my stretching. I've done my foam rolling. My body feels a lot better. And then it was then a case of starting to be more religious in, well, right, I need to, I'm, I'm going to bed in an hour. So I've been wearing my blue light blocking glasses, um, which are modeled by Chris for the nighttime ones and the daylight ones by myself. And then, um, and then it was making sure I was turning every, turning the lights off and making sure that my sleep hygiene was good so that it, I, I find it, it's one of those things. It's a perpetual thing that you have to have good sleep to feel energetic during the day. And then, to, but people to combat, combat that will take caffeine, which then affects their sleep. And it's one of those things that it's either in a negative feedback loop or a positive feedback loop. So it, it, it does take a little bit to kick the negatives, but yeah, that's that that's how I managed to start slotting these things in was was an element of multitasking really, and fundamentally trying to put the phone down more and be more accountable to myself for how often I was picking the phone up and going scroll, 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 scroll. scroll oh sugar, an hour's passed. Yeah, I love that, and I love the fact that an endurance like in my opinion all sports and to, to be good at all sports takes time and effort and time management to a certain degree but endurance in particular especially if you get into like the ultra side of endurance you have to be so good at managing your time because it takes the training takes up such a large portion of your time so like things like you, you said there, like doing the foam rolling when you're watching your your tv and stuff and for example like just just before this podcast i've got some some of these like rehab exercises i've got to do just now and they're, they're incredibly boring exercises and they would be, I've even thought about making a YouTube video, but they're so boring that um, people probably would get, would just turn it off, but they're, they're very good exercises and I understand the importance of doing them. So what I do is I put something on in the background, like a podcast or a, or a, like some sort of YouTube video that I'm, I'm wanting to watch. And again, every single night before I go to bed, I do stretching as well in front of the TV. So we'll put something on the telly, like whatever, chilling, chilling out and then I'll do my stretching and then I go up to, to bed and read a bit before, before bed. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really powerful, man. And you also tied it in with the sort of the caffeine problem. So let's, let's go a bit deeper into that. I, I think that's a good one to, to kind of segue into. Um, so what's your, what's your kind of protocols and habits around caffeine intake and stuff just now then? So I've, I, I, I've, I've, been guilty of falling into the caffeine trap i won't lie to you um especially at work when someone pops the kettle on it just becomes instinctive for you to go yep i'll have one yep i'll have one and i, I ended up in, in a situation that at, at one point i was drinking as bad as it was four or five cups of tea a day but because i like my tea particularly strong i was double tea bagging so i was having the equivalent of 10 cups of tea a day and ultimately 
that was absolutely ruining me because my sleep was god awful i just wasn't switching off at night and then during the day i'm going well i feel awful so i need more caffeine to feel more energetic which is affecting my sleep so i made the decision after making the realization of how bad that was of going cold turkey and that was vile absolutely vile i, I won't lie to you going going from 10 cups of tea a day to none was horrendous uh, i wouldn't advise it i wouldn't advise anyone getting into that position in the first place if i'm honest um so i went cold turkey and i just made sure that i was i allowed myself to to almost reset and detox and for me it took about a week um and it's something that i have written about um uh, personally uh, and put out there is, is what my experiences were and the main things i had was headaches i had flu-like symptoms really bad energy really bad fatigue but eventually once i got my sleep cycle good i didn't need the caffeine anymore i felt energetic without it and as long as i was staying well hydrated it was great so my current protocols at the moment and and this is something that as i've read around the subject for me i try and ensure that i'm not drinking anything caffeinated even if it's just a standard cup of tea which usually sits around the 40 to 50 milligrams of caffeine per cup i try and avoid after four, after 2 p.m. or 1400 of just cutting that out and making sure that I'm not drinking caffeine after that time, because I'm not sure if, if many people know, but the half life of caffeine is around five to seven hours, depending on what your metabolism rate is. And what that means is if you're having, say, an espresso at two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, because of the half life, it takes five to seven hours for your body to process half of those that milligram of caffeine and if you're having an espresso sorry having a cup of coffee at around three four in the afternoon when you're getting to 7 p.m the amount of caffeine in your system is equivalent of having a fresh espresso now if you told someone to take an espresso just before they went to bed they would look at you gone out but people don't realize that that that's how much of an effect it is and how much it accumulates in your body over the day and that's how long it, it just takes to clear out. Now, you could be lucky and have a really quick metabolism, but that's still four hours to get rid of a cup of coffee, 80 milligrams. You're on 40 milligrams still four hours later. So that's those those that's my main protocol, really. And, and limiting it to only two cups maximum in a day so that the accumulation doesn't happen. And I don't get to the point where in the evening I'm still, I may not feel like I'm buzzing, but I know air. Uh, at an endo endocrinology chrono, my endocrinology is still absolutely buzzing from all that caff all the stimulant buzzing around my system yeah it's um it's one of those drugs and it is a drug it's one of those drugs that doesn't really get called a drug coffee or tea you know it's just normal it's just it's just one of those things that everybody consumes on a daily basis um and like and quite high amounts as well and if you look into you've you've studied all this as well so you know this stuff um if you look into the effects of caffeine on the long term as well so we're talking short term acute effects here with sleep quality and uh and that kind of thing but if you look at the long term data of chronically consuming caffeine uh, like effects on the adrenals and things like that it's, it's not good um, but i've no. definitely been in that and similar traps that you've been in like with you mentioned about the coffee machine being on at work i think um I've been there and it's, you know, you have one cup and then it's like, that was really good. And you go back for another and it becomes a habit. Uh, I used to do pre-workouts as well back in, back in my uh, gym days, back in the bodybuilding days. And I remember like, I remember being, um, taking pre-workout at like after work at like five, six o'clock at night. And then wondering why I would get back and try and sleep at 10 o'clock. And although I knew the importance of sleep and recovery, I wasn't sleeping properly. And I was like, this is something's not this negative feedback loop, like you said is uh is kicking in as well do you do any like so do you do any protocols for any like for long-term caffeine use do you ever do you ever have like weeks off or anything here or there um i would yeah ultimately i would say the the short answer is yes i i do as soon as i notice myself like getting out of control and i notice myself um getting to a state where i'm i'm drinking too much on the caffeine front i do very quickly go right this is too much. I need to detox. I need to cut it all out. But at the moment, and I think a very easy way of, of, of still keeping the habit going, but not having the same amount of, of pure 
stimulant in your system is just substituting it for caffeine free teas. So that's one thing that I very much particularly enjoyed is having a caffeine free tea. And I, I, I have pine needle tea, silver pine needle teas, um, rubius tea. Uh, I've had fruit teas. Um, and then there's, there's obviously there's a plethora of different ones you can out, have out there. Um, I had a guilty, particularly guilty pleasure of, of drinking a lot of the Twinings um, super blends. Those, there are a lot of those are really flavorsome, have lots of benefits to them, but at the same time, they are caffeine free. And so it became a bit of a butt of the joke at work when I had this desk covered with about eight or nine different kinds of tea, but it, 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 kept, it kept me from, from delving into just going for your standard English, English breakfast tea and just going and just subconsciously just taking it in just without even consciously going, this is caffeinated, I want a stimulant. It was just, uh, I'm having a hot drink. Oh, the secondary effect was was caffeine. I think that's that, that almost lack of thinking towards a stimulant is what a lot of people make, as you say. A lot of people go, oh, let's go for a coffee. It's, it's okay, it's four in the afternoon, but let's have a catch up because it's, it's, it's a social norm to do it over co coffee. But they don't go, if you said, let's have a catch up, whilst taking a drug a lot of people go whoa what are you trying to say it, it's the way that it's phrased it's the way that people process it in their head that i think is is the main challenge that people just don't realize yeah yeah you're spot on and um yeah i've, I've been in similar situations with all the tea bags um because teas i mean like like I, I do consume caffeine as well um but i do have like certain protocols similar to yours in, in place that that stopped me from having any negative health effects. In fact, I use, I actually try and use caffeine to benefit my health uh, um, and benefit other areas of my life as well. Cause you can use caffeine to enhance learning. I don't know if you've heard about that, but you can like that you can have caffeine after a learning period and mm -hmm. it will help you retain information because of the cortisol spike and stuff like that. So that's, that's interesting. Um, and in terms of teas as well, I'm not sure you mentioned the pine needle tea there. So teas have got so many, amazing health properties like that that coffee just doesn't have you know coffee's got some health properties as well you know antioxidants and all that good stuff but um do you want to do you want to talk a bit about different about teas and stuff do you want to like how, how what... so i i think on the, on the most part i'm the the full the full extent of what what all the the various different teas have when it comes to a to the health benefits i'm i'm not fully au fait on i must admit a lot of them uh, were just being read off the back of the twinings box um if twinings are watching this yes i would like a sponsorship but um chris too but um and now to interrupt the podcast be... uh we, we have an offer on twinings <laughs> <laughs> back to the show so yeah from reading reading the back of the box and saying oh this this has this benefit this has that benefit um i think was it were the main benefits. I've I've since then looked more at the at the pine needle thing and there's, there's the amount of vitamin C in it. The fact that it's it's a more bioavailable version. Uh, it's something that we've been doing for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And the fact we managed to make it here before we had the intervention of various different pharmaceuticals clearly shows that we were doing something right. And but then also the the antivirals, as you mentioned, the antioxidant side of things, and I think there, there are a plethora of different things that are a benefit and it, it's quite an easy way of, of, of consuming those benefits without having to consciously go, oh, I need to take, usually we take them as, in the form of a supplement, whereas a tea is very, is not quite as, maybe not quite as judgmental. Um, when, you, when you start popping pills, people will look at you and go, what are you doing? But if you're just drinking a cup of tea, it's not quite as strange, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I do wonder sometimes as well because there are there are certain teas that that have benefits that you can't actually really get the full benefits unless you take the supplement form because it's mm. in a concentrated dose. But I do sometimes think that the teas, uh, well, actually, I know that the, sometimes the teas hold better qualities than the actual supplement. You know, so depending on various different reasons. Um, but yeah, pine needle tea, man. It's anybody who's listening in, look up pine needle tea. Uh, be a little bit cautious with where you get your pine needles from but like if you've got if you're in the uk as i presume most people are going to be in the uk listening to this um scott's pine is 
quite a common um, pine tree. I've got one in my back garden, which I frequently forage from. And uh, it's it's actually it tastes nice. I don't know. Do you drink it on its own? Because I tend to drink it with other with other teas because it, it doesn't have much flavour. I don't find. So I, I yeah, I've done a mixture. I've done some on its own, um, where it's just a case of it. It was a slight citrusy sort of flavour to it, but only very slight. Uh, it's like half the strength of, of maybe flavoured water. Uh, but then most of the times, yes, I, I will typically throw it in with something else because um, it doesn't overpower the flavour of the other thing. Um, so that's that's typically how I, I take it. Yeah, we could talk about teas for a, for a long time, but let's we did promise everybody we were going to talk about barefoot running. So we kind of went from running to to sleep because you need to sleep in order to run better. Um, yeah, so let's should we take it back around to running again? Um, so you, you got into barefoot slash minimal running how long ago now? A couple of years ago? You've been there. So um, I think the, the interest for me spiked back when I was at college. So that was around the 10 year mark. Um, and for me, I tried to get in at university, but I made a lot of mistakes um, at university about how to do it properly. And I suffered quite a lot of injuries from it. Uh, attend, I had to. I, I completely ditched it because the impain, impatient part of me just went, "Oh, I can't do it. I'm going to go back to running what I knew, what my body was accustomed to, not realizing a the benefits, but b the full extent of the preparations that it required for you to to be able to do it in an efficient manner and it, and in a manner without injuries. But for me to unlock that door, I kept trying to go back to it and. I kept getting injuries. I kept getting calf injuries, feet injuries. There were so many different things that it just wouldn't click for me. And I, I was getting really frustrated by it because I kept seeing the various different people. This is this was pre um, seeing things like the Nat Life Tribe and, and the Natural Lifestylist, or aka Tony Riddle. Um, it, this was mainly being driven by one of the guys at, at college that started running around in the Vibram Five Fingers. And I was wearing them to uni. I was going to the gym in them. I was wearing the footwear, but I just couldn't get the running to click. And I then moved um, away for work. And even whilst I was at work, they, it just wouldn't click for me. I just couldn't get it. And I couldn't, I was really getting frustrated with it. And I came across, uh, it was through Ross Edgley, actually. I came through, came across uh, the, the Vivo Barefoot. And I didn't realize that it was such an established brand. I thought it was just the Vibram Five Fingers that were really the only, the only brand. And I know there was, um, I think it's the Merrills as well, which are another brand that, that were quite common, but I'd never heard of Vivo. So I thought, well, firstly, they look more like conventional shoes. So that was the first thing that, that kind of drew me towards them because Wearing those five fingers, the amount of comments and stick and double looks you get walking through public with your toes out um, with those those shoes. I, it, it, <laughs> I mean, I do love them, but there were there was quite a few instances where I I couldn't uh, couldn't wear them in such certain social um, social occasions, and so the thing that drew me to Vivo is they have such the wide array. They have you have the casual wear, you have the hikers, you have the ones for running, you have the ones for the gym, you actually have a leather shoe version, and I pretty much have the whole collection now. But that's what drew me towards Vivo. And one of the things that really, really drew me even close to Vivo and why I would actively say go to Vivo barefoot, maybe with a Vibram, was the experience, the shopping experience. So I went to their shop in London. I didn't, I didn't buy them online. I was in London. I went to their shop. It's a quite a quite little quaint shop um, near Covent Garden. And when I went in, I remember explaining to them, I was like, look, I've had the Vibrams. I'm having these issues with them. And next thing you know, they dragged me into the back with a couple of their coaches and wearing a set of jeans and a T-shirt. I was not prepared for it in any way, shape or form. They, they went through this full uh, method of um, how to run barefoot and to show me what I was doing wrong. And it was a game changer. Like even that 20 minutes, they showed me so many things that, was, that were wrong, that, was, that, 
that I had wrong with my running form that when I went back to then doing it in my own time, it revolutionized it. And from that moment on, I never looked back. And suddenly I was like, I can do this. and I'm not getting injured. I can run further than a mile. I can run further than a mile and a half. And I started to inter, uh, interleave it into my normal trading until eventually I, I picked up my Nike free runners and just tossed them. Don't need those anymore. And the Vivos were just the way ahead for me. And I've never really looked back. And that was, I've been running purely in Vivo barefoot now for at least four or five years now, purely on their own. Um, and I would, I say that all, all the little, I've had a lot of people frown upon the barefoot running and oh, your body's not used to it. You're going to get injured. You're going to get this, that and the other. But I've actually had less injuries. Like all the niggles that I had running in my, my Nike free runners, gone all the calf injuries that I had gone, the foot issues that I had gone, the issues that I had in my knees and my hips gone, because actually I'm now using my body's proprioception to run like I'm meant to be running. I'm not just going with the heel of my, of my um, foot on the floor. I'm actually take absorbing the impact as your body's meant to, and not getting that three times my body weight through all my joints and my joints going, whoa what are you doing and now to interrupt the podcast vivo barefoot <laughs> get 25 percent off if you use the code quilty covers no just kidding we're not sponsored by vivo barefoot but we just um i do i love them as well i've got a pair of the vivo primus primus lights and mm -hmm. i got them about four or five years ago now and i've worn them literally like i don't run them every day or anything but i've worn them for so many things and they're only just starting to fall apart now. And now you can send them back in, can't you? And get them revived, and recycled. Yeah, you can. Um, did you use that service for, for the revival thing? I, I haven't due to various circumstances around work wouldn't allow me to, to send them back and get them in, in, a, in a decent manner. And I I think I with one of the handy tools with Strava is I've seen that my the latest pair of stealths, I'm on the Primus lights now as well, but... My first set of stealths lasted me about a year, year and a half before I started burning through the bottom of them. Um, but my second set, I think with Strava, I'd got something through like 1,200 miles through them. And apart from a couple of holes here and there, you actually couldn't tell that I'd, I'd worn them for 1,200 miles. Whereas if you looked at like a, no a normal set of running shoes, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you, you simply will go, oh, you can tell you've run in those because you've lost the heel. This part's worn down and that part's worn down. Um, they're a phenomenal creation and I, yeah, I love them as well. Yeah, they're brilliant. I mean, I, I will be totally upfront here. I don't run in Vivo Barefoots or Barefoot Shoes every day. I do, I run and I usually use Ultras, which are like, a, I don't know if you've used Ultras before, but they're like a, they're a good starting point, I would say, for people that are wanting to run in barefoot shoes. So for the example that you gave when you were transitioning to barefoot running, you just couldn't get it. You were constantly having these problems and stuff. The ultras basically are a zero drop. So there's no heel to toe drop, which causes so many problems. And I had the same thing as you. I was seeing podiatrists and stuff and, and they were saying, um, they were saying, I'll oh, be very careful wearing, wearing barefoot shoes because I had a pair of, I had my Vivo uh, Primus lights on. And he says, oh, do you always wear them? He says, yeah, yeah. I says, well, don't run these every single day. And he goes, I'll be careful if you're running them because you'll get Achilles problems and stuff. And I was like, well, no, actually, I had Achilles problems before I changed to ultras and barefoot shoes. And then I didn't actually get any after mm -hmm. I changed to the to the barefoot shoes. So that, that'll tell you a lot. But you can, people do get these problems. Um, so ultras are a good kind of transitionary thing. But I do, I do barefoot running as part of my sort of, weekly program my sort of weekly training if you call it that and um, i make sure i incorporate some to ensure that i'm ingraining the proper technique so when i do use my ultras i'm still using that same technique and not allowing the, any cushioning to to kind of take away that that technique because it will it will over time if you're if you're constantly running in cushion shoes you're you're going to lose that ground feel you know you're and then your knees and hips are not going to be moving in the correct patterns and stuff um so you, you do all your running in Vivos, don't you? You run every single day. So, yeah. so anybody out there that thinks that you can't 
do that is is incorrect and i know they're incorrect because i've because i've ran in vivos for like a month solid and had no no problems you know and um, it's just building up slowly but so what what advice would you if any would give to somebody who's thinking about transitioning to using vivo barefoots so first of all would you get a pair of vivo barefoots or maybe a pair of ultras to start off would be would be my suggestion but um any, any other kind of advice that you'd give people in terms of transitioning so, so again this is something that is all from personal experience so I, I feel like i had a wide array of problems so the first the first thing that i would would really recommend for is obviously once you've got the shoes is walking around in them um and you probably hear it many many a time quoted when it comes to the vivos uh various different adverts that you see for vivos or for where podcasts are sponsored by vivo that just wearing them for a certain amount of time actually increases the strength of your feet by around 60 to 70 percent which clearly shows that there's there's a level of hypertrophy that's required within the feet to start functioning in a proper manner so that was my, that would be my first advice is just walking around in them because getting used to that amount of feeling in your feet again is actually quite weird and especially when you're walking through cities and whatnot where you wouldn't have felt anything because your feet would have been numb to to the outside world suddenly going oh that's what the crack in the pavement feels like and oh that's what a drain cover feels like is is, is a very weird experience and and with that i would definitely get off road get onto trails get used to the undulating surfaces that even though they look flat when you actually walk along them you you've got that that that's slightly sharper than what i've ever known it that's slightly rougher so that'd be my first tip when it actually starts to then coming into the running it slow and steady is is very much the case and making sure that you're not chucking yourself in so i i when i got my vibrams made the mistake of doing three miles thinking i run on my four foot i'll be fine couldn't walk properly for a week like i categorically my calves became um came like rocks it was like having two pieces of concrete at the bottom of my of my legs i i had no dorsiflexion at all because my feet my my calves were just that bad um so that would be my second tip is don't do a 5k straight away <laughs> stupid idea um so I, I i personally i did half a mile and left it a couple of days and half a mile then left it a couple of days and half a mile and then use the the old adage of 10 percent increase every week and just increasing 10 percent 10 percent 10 percent 10 percent but then I think a common mistake a lot of people make and something that I made is when when they read how you're meant to run barefoot, a lot of things will quote, you're meant to be on your forefoot. And that is not correct because the mistake that I made is I went, okay, I've got to land on my forefoot. So I've got to land on the balls of my feet. So I was holding my calves at tents as I was making impact with the ground trying to make sure that I was landing on the balls of my feet. So I was landing like that with, with my calves tense every single time. And, and what that was bringing was, was those, were those awful injuries that my calves were like, what, what is this? Just they couldn't handle what was going on to them. And this is where the visit to Vivo Barefoot, um, I can only thank Ben forever for, for the tips that he gave me. But one of the common things that, the thing that he taught me was actually what each muscle group's meant to do whilst you're running. Um, and I'm by no means an expert, but this is this is what what I, has been quoted to me. Um, but he he said that your your quads are primary for lifting your leg. Most people would try and push off with their quads. Maybe if you're sprinting, yes, but quads lift the leg. That is it. They just lift the leg. He said, then the next as you're going through the stride, the next part of the stride is is the landing part and he said one common mistake people make is they obviously they stride out in front of them so that's the first mistake more likely to heel heel land, land on their heels but then the other thing is you're actually meant to relax your feet they're shock absorbers you're meant to allow them to absorb the elastic energy as your the midfoot hits the floor so i it sounds very flat-footed and people say it sound like make very different um comparisons to to what it sounds like when you're running because it sounds like you're kind of slapping the floor a little bit i find but he said 
you've got to let your feet and your calves relax and allow your heel to kiss the floor and allow everything from your knee down just to relax you're not meant to be thinking about the impact or else you'll tense up for the impact just let your legs go and they'll realize how they're meant to hit the floor again um, then he said as you're moving through the stride the next point is obviously you should be pulling back to push yourself forward you don't actually push back to go forward or pull to go forward you 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 push with your calf uh, with your hamstring your glute to project yourself forward and is and then obviously you start the process again you're then using your quads to lift your leg up and and breaking that down and being really self-conscious about that part of the running was key for me because the mistake I was making was I was thinking I need to tense up and land on my forefoot and be really tense at the bottom of my legs but actually it's completely the opposite I had to be fully relaxed and let the body flow through and then I ditched headphones when it came to running I, I, and I started to be really um, in tune with what was happening and suddenly I went oh I'm I'm hitting the floor really hard. Oh, my breathing's completely out of whack. Oh, I'm I'm landing way ahead of me. And suddenly it all suddenly just clicked into motion. And I was like, and now I see why it's a skill that so many people have forgotten. And it and once you've got that flow, that flow state, it, it just feels magical because you can just go and go and go and go. And you're not fighting it. Your body is just it's probably something that's been mentioned a lot of times by running coaches that I've listened to in particular people like like Tony Riddle where you're 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 just falling you're constantly falling and catching yourself and you aren't just falling you're not fighting you're you're just letting yourself go letting yourself go and it's quite a a freeing experience rather than going I've got to run this 5k and I need to battle through and it hurts exactly yeah and uh yeah that fallen thing i'm just i'm just picturing now so if you imagine yourself standing up straight all you've got to do is just lean forward and then just flow like you said and just flow with it and just relax and Mm -hmm. and yeah headphones as well like i years ago i ditched using headphones um the last i can't remember the last time i ran with headphones and to be honest i I did i have done it yeah, it's been a couple of years, personally. Because um, I, I just love the feeling of being present. You know, it's it's obviously if you're running around busy streets and stuff, it's good for a safety perspective. But like being out mm-hmm. in nature, man, and running, I don't, I just don't need music. I don't need podcasts. I don't need. It. I just get into that kind of. You almost alluded to it there. That kind of meditative flow state is. It's quite. Um, I find it quite a sort of spiritual practice. I find I get into sometimes deeper states of meditation running than i ever do actually meditating and i've tried some pretty wacky meditation routines like binaural beats hmm. and all sorts of fre- frequencies and all sorts you know and, I, and i've managed to get into some some states with um with running where i've like literally been going along a trail for miles and been totally lost in it you know um, hmm. so it's, it's great and yeah great advice there um with the tra- i didn't actually mention before as well with the barefoot running so the reason that i don't always use barefoot shoes is because i'm lazy well it's not just because i'm lazy it's because um so there's a couple of reasons actually and i'll just quickly go over them um one the problems that we have with with a lot of barefoot shoes is and vivo barefoot have almost tackled this is the lugs on the bottom for fell running hill running mountain running especially in like scotland and the bogs and stuff here is even the soft ground lugs are just no comparison to the likes of what Innovate can provide. Now, Innovate's mm-hmm. problem is that their shoes are too narrow and they only have one model that, that I would use, which is an older model they've stopped making with the really thick, they're like, they're like uh, football stud kind of grips. And anybody who's into fell running and stuff will, will know Innovate, big brand. Um, but Ultra, again, they can't match Innovate's lug depth, but they do have better ones in my opinion than Vivo Barefoot but the cushioning is for there's only a certain point and, and there are elite athletes and stuff that run in Vivo Barefoots and, and whatever but there's a certain point for me that I have to I have to have a bit of cushioning on some of these really gnarly trails if I want to go mm. fast and I like racing fast <laughs> so when it comes to racing and down, especially downhills it's like my my feet would just get trashed no matter how good my technique was 
Um, but there is a risk with that, and it is, it is a, it's a trade-off. You know, it's a risk if you're wearing cushioned shoes. The risk of you, the risk of you taking a wrong step is higher because you, you can get away with more. You know, you can step on dodgier rocks and stuff that you wouldn't do in a natural environment. And you're risking your technique, especially as you get tired, um, kind of fading away. But that's my my thoughts on that. But I'm guessing you, from the sounds of it, you're just you're totally sold on the the minimal running. You're never going to go back to. Well, in fact, you're coming up for you're coming up for a mountain run, so we'll see how your Vivo barefoots get get on in the, in the gnarly <laughs> the gnarly Scottish mountains. So, uh, yeah, no, I so I've got the the Vivo firm ground, uh, and I've run I run around the more flatter trails of um, Fife um, when I used to live up there in those, and they, they weren't particularly too much of an issue. Um, I may have to invest in the firm ground ones before I visit but you know I the only time that I've ever gone back was I did a a race it was an eight hour endurance OCR and the only thing I had was the innovates because all the vivos at the time that I had were completely fat bottomed and the issue that I had is my feet cramped like th- during the race because of how compromised they were in the narrow toe box and how used I was to having the wider toe box I just had issues where my feet would cramp and even and then when I try and deal with that I stretch that out I'd have another issue in in my perennial and then I'd have another issue in my calf and for me I, I couldn't I just couldn't agree with it I, unfortunately I just could not agree with with the with the set of um of the set of innovates that I had so for me, yes, I'm completely sold. Um, I find it painful now to wear narrow shoes um, because I'm so used to my feet being in that wider, splayed out um, sense. And I, I wear the Vivo canvas shoes all day, every day, walking around town. Um, I'm running in the Primus Lights. I go to the gym in the Primus Lights. I'm never wearing a non-Vivo um, because they have that, luckily they have that flexibility and that range. So for me, yeah, I'm I'm completely sold. Maybe if if I were to maybe try the old um, ultras, that they might suit me. Uh, I know they have a, a wider toe box, but I I don't know. I, I feel like I, I'm in it. I'm in it now. I'm in the I'm in the bubble. I'm in the Vivo bubble. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think you, I don't think you'd need to change to be honest um, for what for what you're doing unless you particularly felt a need to you know and, and the, the vivo if you get a pair of the vivo soft grounds they are they are good um i know i do know people that race i've seen people race on some pretty gnarly trails with the with the soft grounds um it's when you get a combination i find off so the soft grounds are okay for for really wet like hilly trails um they, they've got good grip not as good as as the as the innovates but they're still good enough but then if you have a mixed terrain where there's really rocky sections and stuff on downhills and you're trying to tank it down there, yeah, it's just, there's a certain point where it's, it becomes detrimental to your performance. And it's, it is basically, it's, I suppose, cheating in a way, in a kind of, mm. you know, in a, in a acceptable fashion. Um, but yeah, so I don't think, yeah, I think you'll be you'll be good with the Vivos, man. If you if you love them, stick with them because they're they are great, and I I love them too, and I I recommend them to people all the time. I just recommended my sister; she was asking about shoe advice the other day, and I recommended she gets a pair of the Primus Lights. I got a pair for my mum for her birthday last year, and she wears them every time I see her near enough now. <laughs> but they're the bright white ones, so she's like she's so paranoid about getting them dirty all the time, so she only wears them like to she only she only wear them if she's like indoors and stuff. She doesn't like wear them outside. <laughs> So I need to get another pair. Um, what about barefoot running and like totally barefoot running? Do you do much of that? Do you? So uh, for those that do follow me on Instagram, uh, there were there have been a few occasions where I've started to delve into uh, pure barefoot running, and even even with the very minimalism of the very small uh, sole that you have on the on the Vivos, I noticed that my running technique when I went full full barefoot changed even more and I noticed that the strides got even shorter and they got even quicker and I the impact got even smaller uh, because even though it's very minimal cushioning on the vivos they it still numbs your feet slightly so as soon as I when I was trying I, I, to be fair it was on flat road that I was doing it but 
on that flat road, it and I made sure it was in a controlled manner that I'm not running around the streets of, of my of, of the city, making sure that having to dodge glass and God knows what else. So I do want to get more into that, but I think my main my main fear on that front is is exactly that now that I'm in a situation, I'm now back home and I'm not currently away with work. The I'm I'm kind of worried about getting into the situation of running through the city and next thing you know, on some glass or on this. That's what I'm now worried about. Yes. Um, yeah. I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. And I'm doing it over the next couple of weeks as I move, I'm doing a little bit of a small UK road trip and I'm going to the Peak District, I'm going to the, uh, the Lake District. I may just try and venture out on the trails a little bit with nothing on the feet, um, but maybe not quite running, but just to reconnect and also grounding as well. All the benefits of grounding properly. Um, and then in a controlled manner, try and find a way to introduce running maybe in an urban setting or semi-urban setting with nothing on. Yeah, good idea. Grounding, man. Or oh, we could go down that rabbit hole a little bit, couldn't we? <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, what? Grounding? What's going on here? Although people listening to this probably already know about grounding, but because um, we talk about it all the time. Um, yeah, man, it's it's a shame because it's it's awesome. It's an awesome feeling running barefoot outside, but it's very dangerous. Mm. Um, like, and you've got to, you can't really take a haphazard approach to this because I've seen people who've literally sliced their foot, and it takes years. If you do some serious damage to the tendons and that in the bottom of your foot, it takes years to recover from that sort of stuff. Or you could like, you know, you could step on a rusty nail or something, you know, and then get tetanus and that's going to cause you problems, you know? So there's, <laughs> there's all sorts yeah. of things that you've got to be very careful of. Um, heroin needles as well, you know, that could be that could be an issue if you don't want to get HIV or something. So <laughs> there's, uh, there's a plethora of problems when you're running around in urban settings. Yeah, and I've done it before. I, I was walking through the woods um, stupidly with like through like sort of quite boggy, it got kind of boggy in the woods and I was barefoot and it was, I was started off on like nice terrain and uh, I actually cut my foot. I didn't realize I'd done it as I was walking, but I cut it and I was like, I got home and I was like, oh, this is not good. I don't know what I stepped on. Could have been a rusty nail or something. And it was, I was walking through all this kind of dirty puddles and everything. So yeah, you've got to be careful, man. Um, yeah, grounding though. Grounding uh, is, a, is a powerful um, tech, powerful technique. I'm going to call it a technique. Powerful thing <laughs> isn't practice. it yeah it's a powerful practice man do, do you do it every day do you try and ground every day do you have any methods practices so frust frustratingly for me um the family decided that grass was no longer needed in the back garden and paved over the whole thing um uh, back when i was a wee boy and before i could um, have any influence over over can we have some grass for the grounding part, please? So at the moment, grounding isn't quite um, in there yet. Uh, I could, I guess I could stop being lazy and walk to the park and do that in the mornings um, or in the evenings. Um, and I think since since I've been back in the, in the home setting, it's been a case of working out those routines and reincorporating the things that, whereas whilst away with work, I could walk outside the, where I was staying and there would be grass and I'd stand on the grass and I go, Oh, that feels great. Um, and you can feel the, the tickle of the grass and you feel, uh, just feel more relaxed just naturally from being on, mm -hmm. on natural ground. But for me here, unless I went next door um, or popped over the fence early in the morning, um, it would have to be a case of going to the, to a local park. And, um, and as you said, as we discussed about the, the pro potential problems of that, that's the only real, situation that I could go into grounding. As for other practices, um, I'm in the process of reintroducing the Wim Hof method breathing um, back into, into things here. Um, cold showers is another one uh, that, that, I, that I love doing. And then I think the, the only other religious ones that I have at the moment are the, the, the pre-bedtime rituals of turning out the lights uh getting my ver my version of the amber blue light blockers on 
getting out my diary, scheduling the next day, mm. then a little bit of um, a little bit of meditation um, in the past, and it's something that I need to reincorporate again. Journaling, um, which a lot of people, it it is pretty much a case of just going, dear diary, this is what happened today. This is how I felt. This is what I've noticed over the last few days. And suddenly, when you get things out onto the paper and it's out of your head, it makes it a lot more sense. And I think a lot of people are far too much in here and you haven't got that much thinking room. And when, but it's when it's on the paper and suddenly you go, oh, this made me feel like this. And you write it down and you suddenly acknowledge that and go, oh, and that made me feel like this. And then you write that down and then you go, oh, I got this behavior, which was feeding this behavior, which means I now fit. And I think that starts that snowballing effect of, of understanding your behaviors, your habits, your feelings towards what's happening in the world um, is, is, is almost life changing that, that you start having those, that understanding of what, what is going on to you. And it, it, it's the, the, the saying that I've heard many times is you stop being a human doing and you're more of a human being because you now understand what, what, what being is, what is, what is, what you're doing every day and how you're being every day. Yeah, man, that's, that's really powerful. The, the journaling is, like you can't under, you know, you can't, it's, it's really hard to get around people's heads because it sounds a bit kind of, a bit like, a bit weird. Like, why am I going to write stuff down in a diary? You know, we're, we're all, we're in this kind of technological age now. Everything's on our, you know, you could do a, a journal on your phone if you want I suppose but um it's not it's not the same in my opinion and I, I do it every day as well I do it every morning I do a little bit and it's often it is just just rubbish but it gets it out of your head do you ever do a a brain dump like where you where you just sit for like I, I I recommend this to anybody who is like stressed they've got a lot of things going on whatever is do like a full brain dump so like you're talking like 30 minutes up to an hour you can do this for and just have paper and just write down everything on your mind just everything going on have you ever done that before that's quite a powerful i i admittedly i haven't the well i'll, I'll quickly luckily here's why i prepared earlier i kind well i guess i kind of did something like that um and i kind of did like a in a diary just everything i needed to achieve this week and it was just a, a pure dump of everything that suddenly was was tossing up in my head of i need to do this i need to do that and then I find that when you've got too many things to do and it's all in your head, you very much go, but I need to start this, but I need to start this, but I need to start this, but I need to start this. And you, you don't do anything because you're constantly worrying about what you need to do and not actually doing what you need to do to stop you worrying about what you need to do. Um, and then, but then the other thing is um, I often find that after listening to podcasts, listening to gym um, stuff and whatnot, that at work, I, I, at work, I used to train during lunchtime um, and then I would go in for my meal. But I'd have listened to a podcast during that gym session and so many things I wanted to write about or talk about or make Instagram reels on. And that is just a small insight of all the various different notes and ideas that I have that need to then come into fruition. But there's, there's about 10, 15 pages of A4 here, folded in half, double-sided with four or five notes on each one of, of something that pops up and I go, oh, that's a creative spark. I can write about this on the blog. Or, oh, that's a creative spark. I can make a video about that. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't, I've never tried the full hour of, all right, everything out, get out on the page. Um, but I, I, I guess I kind of do something similar like that. Yeah, if you're doing it frequently anyway, you probably don't have that many things up in there. But as you alluded to before, most people do have a lot of stuff like, inside their head and i suppose the way to look at this is that if you're if you imagine like your brain's a computer because it is essentially if you look at your think of your brain as a computer and your hard drive is full to the maximum capacity and it keeps on all you're going to see is this message keep on saying your hard drive is is almost full or it's you're running low in storage all the time you can't get anything else in mm. so you just you end up in this in a negative sort of feedback loop again where you're wanting to learn new things. You're wanting to expand your life. You maybe want to get a promotion or something or start a new course or whatever it might be, you know, 
many things you want to do, take up a new hobby, but you can't do these things because you your head's so clouded. So that like that there, what you said there is brilliant. Like getting those ideas, and not only that, you're also if you get those ideas out into the world, you don't forget them then. Because there's always this part of our mind which is like it's trying to store and remember things. And then it's either going to forget them or you're going to be worrying about forgetting them, which are, are both yeah. not ideal, you know. Um, so no, great stuff there, man. Going back to your grounding for a second, though, I didn't want to interrupt as you were you were on a roll. Um, <laughs> do you know you can get you can get the benefits of grounding through cement as well? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, not a lot of people, not a lot of people know this because if you've watched like the documentary Earth is Earthing Grounding, there's a documentary about it and. Um, there's, there's all sorts of stuff out there in books and people talk about it all the time. You always think of walking on the grass. And right enough, walking on the grass is a bit better. So there's different levels of, of how much benefit you're going to get. So like the, the, the top sort of, um, the top benefits are going to be from on the beach, on wet sort of sand or in the sea, because you've got salt water, which is a conductor of electricity, and you've got the wet sand. So it's obviously a touches your body and then you're getting that's going to get you the best benefits then it's going to be like wet grass or wet soil or just wet earth on trails whatever and then it'll be dry and then it's then it's um cement you've got to be careful with um asphalt it doesn't come through asphalt but it comes through cement or any kind of stone as long as it's like a natural kind of stone you'll mm-hmm. still get some you still get some benefits for it and um as well just while i'm on this i'm kind of just doing a bit of a brain dump just now myself is if you uh if you want the best times to do it it's unfortunately in the uk just now it's not really um ideal this but after the sun has been high in the sky so late afternoon is when the sun has been beaten down on the ground and that's when they're going to get the highest amounts of earth and so if you are having to go into your back garden and onto your cement slabs the best benefits you're going to get are going to be probably in the afternoon after the sun's been up in the sky and if it's wet even better and you just need to stand there for 22 minutes to allow the blood to circulate around your entire body which gives you all the full benefits of being grounded for the day so there you go i didn't i did not know that there was a set time i had to do it for (laughs) no you don't have to but there's like (laughs) like 30 seconds is better than none 20 minutes is going to give you like is going to give you like a really good sort of dose i suppose if you can do longer, even better, you know, like the, the more you can do it, if you can be grounded all the time, that's even better. I've, I've actually got an earthing strap as well. You can buy these earthing, you've probably seen earthing bed sheets and earthing devices and stuff. So I've got an earthing strap, which I basically put on every night. Just I just bought that because it's cheaper than a sheet and it basically does, mm. essentially does pretty much the same thing. Um, so I don't know if you've, have you ever looked into those kind of gadgets. This is all news for me. No, no, you can, you can get these kind of gadgets as well. So I'm not like I'm not a huge biohacker, but the glasses and the earthen, uh, earthen straps yeah. are pretty good. Um, yeah, man, pretty good stuff. What time are we on? Cool. Um, should we round it off with a bit about sleep again? Because you you did touch on caffeine. Um, you touched on your sort of evening routine where you do a bit of a bit of journaling and. Is there anything else in there that you think would be useful for the listeners? Um, so, so what, what, what I deem to be the ultimate sleep routine, or well, what I did for me anyway, was uh, making sure that I've eaten two to three hours before the time that I actually want to go to bed. So I think that's the first thing because going i think going to bed when you're still in the process of digesting for me acid reflux was a common one that i would get and i would often wake up randomly in the middle of the night with like a really dry mouth or like that that um heartburn feeling which is which is never ideal so and i've heard various different people such as um dr andrew huberman um indicate that the best sort of time you've got to eat about two to three hours before bed to have that optimized sleep routine so that's that would be my that's my first thing the second thing is when i'm hitting two hours before i go to bed i start to turn off all the lights so um it'd be around about now that i'd start turning off the main light in the room and i'd have more of an amber a light with that amber hue and um, whether that be from uh something like a lamp that's got a, a lampshade over it or for me I have a Himalayan um, pink salt lamp 
whatever it may be, it's, it's still sunlight, but it is very much very ready orangey light. Um, so you, you're getting less of the, the green and the blue wavelengths um, of the full light spectrum, which is what essentially is affecting your sleep. And for those that, that don't really know, um, that the main, the main hormone that you're looking to have released in your body is melatonin. The melatonin is released as your circadian rhythm gets towards you wanting to go to bed, it will start to release this melatonin. However, when your eyes start to see blue and green parts of the light spectrum, they go, oh, it must be sunny outside. Maybe I'm confused and I should be awake. So your body will actually stop secreting that melatonin, which is one of the things that people often struggle with when it comes to trying to go to sleep is their melatonin just hasn't come out yet and their body's primed for it to be daytime. And that's one of the issues that we have with a plethora of devices that are around us, whether it be even with the with a normal standard light that you have in a room or your laptop, your phone, your screen, your TV. And yes, you can put those warm settings on, but it's still not ideal circumstances when it comes to that melatonin release. And from from what to get enough melatonin out, you need at least an hour's worth to act, actually be able to su substantially fall asleep and it's to a satisfactory level. But my advice has always been to do two hours. So for me, two hours before bed, the amber blue um, blue light blockers will go on because they completely shut off all the blue uh, blue light. Whereas, which is Chris's modeling, whereas these ones that I'm wearing are the daytime ones, um, and they only cut out certain parts of the spectrum, but not all blue light. Then for me, it's a case of now trying to downregulate myself. So throughout the day, we've been running gymming exercising work stressed us out we've got back social media has been blowing up this has gone viral we've watched the news and everything in, inside our body everything just going ah which is just not ideal for sleeping you wouldn't try and sleep in a room if everyone's going ah at you so why would you try and do it if your head is so for me it's then a case of I then that's when I start doing my stretching. So I'll start stretching in the evening. I try and make sure that I'm listing something that's engaging, but relaxing. So I wouldn't watch a scary movie before bed, or I wouldn't watch a thriller, or I wouldn't watch the news or anything like that. For me, I've, I typically find things that are maybe informative, maybe something with like comedy, not too much that I'm rolling around in hysterics, because then you're getting the endorphins going and that's probably going to keep you awake again. But that's why I start listening to uh, watching or listening to or the perfect thing that I found is the Russell Brand's Luminary podcast is very it's, um, unfortunately it's a subscription one but all his podcasts are very soft and gentle and they talk you through the through the topics and it's it, it's informative but it's relaxing um, and that's I guess just credit to, to Russell's lovely English voice I love, um, I love Russell Brand's uh, podcast as <laughs> I've not got the luminary subscription, but I love his YouTube videos and podcasts. Um, I'm sure you, I'm sure you do too. But I, I wouldn't. It's not something that I would listen to before I go to bed. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna. I think you're talking about the, the more meditation side of things, and that is that because he does them as well, doesn't he? So, so he has two. He has two podcasts on luminary. He has above the noise, um, which is what yeah. I was going to get on to after that. But um, he has um, his under the skin, which he it will be a typical conversation, but it's it's just a normal podcast like this is with various different people that he knows whether it be he's had Jordan Peterson on four times he's had various different philosophers it but but what I've always found is the tone is quite relaxed it, to having it on quiet in the background always chilled me out and then when I was turning dim the lights blue block uh, blue light blocking and all that sort of stuff and stretching I found it calmed me mm. brilliantly so then the stretching I'm releasing all that tension that's built up through the day. I'm trying to get that flow back into the body, clearing out any lactic acid so that my body can cleanse itself and relax itself um, for when it comes to sleeping. And then I think the ultimate parts of the, the, the down regulation for me was the meditation, which, which is perfect. Just sitting there, just, just counting your breath. Um, for me, I found very relaxing. Um, and then for me, the last thing I would usually finish on it whilst I was in bed is I'd do the journaling and I would schedule the next day. So everything that I may be panicking and stressed about, I would get it all out of my head and go, right, I'm going to do it this, this, at this time, this, at this time, this, at this time. Tomorrow's going to be nailed. I know what I need to do and at what times. Happy days. And for me, across that two hour period, I'd go from ah, to ah. 
um and then it, uh, that allowed me to go get into bed i mean luckily i fall asleep anyway but i get into bed and out like a light and i would feel rested in the morning i won't wake up in the morning and suddenly adrenaline oh gotta do this gotta do that gotta do this gotta do that it, it allowed me to then gradually build into the next day yeah that's that's great advice and uh as well like that whole schedule in the day before you go to bed is and I've, I've heard sort of success experts and stuff talk about this before and sort of business mentors and all that and they say that if you write these things down and then go to sleep it gives your mind time to then process those things through the night and you can actually work out problems as you're sleeping so the next day you wake up and you actually have to go ah i've already scheduled my day so i don't have to worry i don't have to stress about anything i've already got it planned and then you might actually realize because you've had time to process it even though you've been sleeping you might score a couple of things off and then go actually this is the priority and you've got priorities then haven't you because again go mm. back to your journaling you can actually prioritize things better when you have them in front of you on paper so great advice again man um yeah, really good advice. And I guess on, on that note, it's probably time to to wrap it up as well because it is getting late. I've had my blue blockers on for a couple hours now. and uh, yeah, I, need to, I need to change over to my set, my other set. Yeah, I'm, I'm an early early bed person when I can. So I, I try and I just I just love sleeping. It's great. And, I, and yeah, man, you've got to have a good wind, good wind down routine because it's so important in the, in the modern world. So thanks for sharing all that advice there. Um, more than welcome I'm sure people that are listening here are going to want to, to hear more of your stuff so where's the best I know you've got you've got a blog as well haven't you so where's the best place for people to connect with Quilty Covers so I have a, a, a plethora of platforms so I have my own website which is QuiltyCovers.com um, and on there I talk about various different lifestyle things fitness side of things and and when when i can travel sort of side of things but most of it's like lifestyle stuff so i've got various different blogs about kicking caffeine when i went sober and kicked alcohol um how to sleep better how to relax better how to get into barefoot running so there's a various different resources that are on there but the more instant method as we all are um, would be social media so on instagram i'm at cruelty covers um on twitter i'm at at cruelty cover blog I couldn't fit the S in. Um, and then on Facebook, I am also at Quilty Covers. Nice. Well, there you go. So go and, uh, go and hit Reese up with any questions you have about any of the topics that he's been discussing tonight. And I'm sure he'll point in the right direction. He'll be, maybe be able to give you a good discount code on Vivo Barefoot as well. Because he was plugging <laughs> in throughout the whole. And, and twinings. You'll get twining, teacups of tea and barefoot shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, man, it's, been awesome. it's been awesome having you on and um, yeah, we, we'll definitely get you back on again to to go down some more rabbit holes. We've got other things we could be talking about there. We we brushed over a few subjects, didn't we, quickly so we can we can dive back into them at some point. Um, I yeah. can't wait, Chris. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get your blue blockers on, man, and uh, let's go and get the wind down routine going. Do some Sounds like a plan to me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks, man. Okay, uh, stop recording.